As you enjoy this episode today, John and I would like to take just a moment and invite you to consider becoming a sponsor of the podcast. For just a couple of pounds or dollars a month, you could help us ensure that we can keep this show free and available to everyone. We've just crossed a hundred episodes of Two Texts and have several thousand listeners per month. So if just a few of you could commit to partner with us, that would be massively helpful as we continue to produce the content you've come to love. If you want to become a sponsor, simply visit twotexts.com or follow the links in the show notes. Thanks for letting us interrupt you. We'll let you get back to enjoying the show now. Well, John, we are kind of thinking about slowly eking our way towards what Paul actually says when invited in Acts chapter 13. But as is our way, we have found much depth to explore in two seemingly innocuous uh, verses of chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, it, it was, it was, I, I really enjoyed the last podcast recording together, David, and reflecting about John Mark. I thought that was a really worthwhile uh, conversation. And, and I, I think a couple of things we introduced, though we often say you don't necessarily build your house on this, I, I think their ideas worth chasing and and some little introductions there. I love that. And 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 in verses 13 and 14 of Acts 13, we get this sort of contrast moment. You get this John Mark leaving for Jerusalem. And then the very next action is like Paul and and Barnabas and the team sort of doing what they normally do. It's like mm-hmm. almost, okay, that's happened. We can't be distracted by this. And then you almost get this sense of matter of factness. On the Sabbath day, they entered the synagogue and they sat down. Mm. I mean, Mm. I I quite love that dynamic contrast. So what's happened in verse 13 could have been enough to like knock everybody say, but oh my goodness, young John's left. Oh, you know, what's going on? It could have caused an internal fracture. There there could have been a whole sort of post-mortem held about it. But it's like, it's almost right, okay, he's gone. Now, what do we do? Oh, I know what we'll do. We'll, 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 we'll go to the next town and we'll go to the synagogue like we normally do on the mm-hmm. Sabbath and we'll sit down and see what the Lord does, see what the Holy Spirit does. I, I, I mean, I love, I love that. I, I, and we, I, I don't think we should read that as a sort of a cold clinical response. But I, I do think that sometimes in the midst of our own challenges and disappointments, one of the things that can really help us is to stick to sort of really good godly disciplines and routines that sort of Mm. go, okay, it's Sunday or in this context, it's Shabbat. That's good. That's good to synagogue because because that's still a good thing to do, even though John Mark is sort of getting on the boat as we speak. So so I, I love that contrast in the face of the disappointment. They sort of do what they normally do. And they end up in this community synagogue context. I, I, I like that. I, I wonder about a few things in here that I want to ask you questions about as well. So warning to the, the listener, if you're anticipating that today we're getting to the details of Paul's sermon, <laughs> we may be disappointed. I can't promise that. It is our intention, but we have been thwarted before by, by, by our own interruptions. <laughs> a couple of things. One is the, the tradition of going on the Sabbath day. I'd love to, I'd love to come mm. to, but also just they went into the synagogue and sat down. Right? Mm. And I, I'm curious on why do you think I have my own musings about it, but but this is the area where you have a more intimate knowledge. So I'm going to put the question to you. But why do you think he makes the point they sat down? Right? It, it seems in his sort of economy of words that he's trying to get us in verse 13 from where they are in, in Paphos right the way across to Antioch and Sidia. But he does take the time to give us the extra Greek words that they that they they were seated there sort of thing. Do you have any reflections on that? Uh, no, I mean, I hadn't thought too too much about it other than like the, the idea that struck me, one little idea was in a sense, although they're potentially hoping for an opportunity to share, which was a pattern. Mm-hmm. So if a guest mm-hmm. 
if a visitor was there who clearly had some either authoritative or rabbinic training or was learned in the scriptures, one of the traditions would be to invite them to come and share or read. So that, mm-hmm. that might be in their thinking. Um, but of course, what's lovely in, in a sense in the sitting down, I think for me, there's two things. N- number one, it's remembering that Paul and by implication Barnabas here, um, they, they still are Jewish. And there's a there's a participation in the Jewish life, which they seem to be extremely comfortable to participate in because there would be a whole raft of things that are not in any way in contradiction to Jesus as Messiah within the Jewish setup. Yeah. So so I, I, I think they seem the sitting down says we're comfortable uh, with being here. And they're not just in the in the synagogue, they're sitting down. I, I think the other little and this is more of a nuance, perhaps mm-hmm. there there's there's a humility here of of just sitting and waiting to be received. But but outside of that, I hadn't thought too deeply about it. So I'd, I'd love to hear your reflections on it, if you've got no, something. No, you're, you're I, thinking in the same space as I am, John, in that sense that I was, I, I, I liked the image because Luke is navigating what are clearly becoming tensions. Mm. So, so what I, as I was reflecting on it, and again, I might be building on what are two words or one word in Greek and three words in, in, in English. But to me, it spoke to the submission to the system to say that to me, what it says is we consider ourselves part of this. So they didn't come to, maybe I say it better like this. I was struck by the normality of it. It's the Sabbath day. So what are we going to do on the Sabbath? Well, we, should, we should go to synagogue, right? Because that's what that's what we do on synagogue. Not what Jewish people do on synagogue. It's what we do because that's who we yeah. are. And and what are you going to do? You're going to go there and cause a fight? Are you going to there and sort of cause an argument? No, we're just going to go there. And we're actually going to do the things that we would always do, which is to sit down. Like I was doing some looking as to... As to is there spaces you can't and does it sort of hint? And I couldn't find anything on that front, except that generally speaking, you go in and sit down to pray. So I, I just struck me, and, and maybe it feels like I'm making a point from nothing, but it struck me just the, the extreme normality of this. Yes. We've not come into this space as the leaders. We've not come into this space as, as, as rebel up starts. We have come into this space as genuine worshippers who are doing what genuine worshippers mm. should do, and I don't know. I just it just sat and it just sat. Can I just say tenderly in my heart that yeah. that that they would do this, and that we yeah. should note perhaps that some of the tensions we generate in terms of even Christians Christianity's terrible history towards Jewish people is that for Paul the most normal thing to do on the Sabbath day was to go to the synagogue. And be part of the service and just attend Absolutely. it. I, no, it, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm making too much, but I thought no, it was no. beautiful. No, I, I, I don't think you're making too much of it at all. And I think one of the dangers when we are reading the book of Acts in a moment like this is that we superimpose onto it the sort of missional dynamic. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. Paul and Barnabas and the guys are rocking up into the synagogue because they're going to want to reach Jews for Jesus sort of thing. Yeah. Now, of yeah. course... As we read on into Acts chapter 13, that, that clearly happens. And there's an amazing invitation that Paul takes absolutely full advantage of. But yeah. the other the other slightly, uh, this leans into your uh, uh, beautiful conclusion, is that, well, if the opportunity hadn't have come mm. for Paul to stand up and teach that day, mm. then they would have just remained part of a synagogue service. Yes. Uh, and they would have engaged in that context. And I and I love the, I, I, I think there is a definite Lucan connection here to the language around Jesus. When Jesus reveals himself through through the prophet Isaiah in Luke chapter four, it says, and he went to the synagogue as was his custom. Mm-hmm. So so you, you, you see Jesus himself operating dynamically within a Jewish worldview and a Jewish system. So there's enough going on in the synagogue that Jesus feels compatibility with, that it is not Mm. at odds with what he's trying to achieve as Messiah. Mm. And if we will just suspend for a moment that Paul and Barnabas and the team are there to reach people for Jesus, if we just hold that for a moment, because we know that's the main objective, 
and we didn't know that, we would read this passage as these are Jewish people going on the Sabbath, the Sabbath to a Jewish synagogue to celebrate worship of the Lord in a traditional Jewish way. And it seems that they are extremely comfortable with the normality of that. And I, and I do love that. And I do, I think the inference to the sitting is definitely a nudge to both. This is routine. And also this is an expression of submission and humility. And I think both of us have sort of have come to that. And I think that's there. And of course, what's beautiful, David, it's out of that humility that maybe an opportunity comes. And, yes. and because they've submitted to the system, the system affords them an invitation to speak. So so there, there, there is, a, and I think they picked that up from Jesus. I think that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't, didn't rebel against uh, thousands of years of Jewish tradition in terms of practice, but often pushed back against bad interpretation of Torah. But, but he submits himself to the system. And as a result, usually the system is giving him opportunity to share and speak. I mean, if if I can be even just a little playful at this point, I, you you went where it was you went to the text that was kind of bouncing around in the back of my head as well. That that we see similar things from Jesus when he goes to synagogue in Luke chapter four. Same author writing the text, of course, yeah. and and of course you get Jesus sitting down in that sense as well. So while you were saying that, I just had a quick look at. Luke 4 verses Acts 13, because that connection was in the back of my mind, but I'd not really looked it up. And I'm just being a little playful here. And there's probably nothing in this, but I love this, <laughs> that in Paul's journey to the synagogue, he goes into the synagogue, sits down, and then they read the law and the prophets. And then they ask him to bring an ex exhortation. He stands up. But in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes into the synagogue and he stands up. He reads the law and the prophets, and then he sits down <laughs> and teaches them. And and I just like, I, I need to go reflect on that longer, but I love that slight inversion from Luke. Mm. And and you, I mean, our listeners know that both you and me think Luke is way cleverer than we even realize. But I'm like, have you done that on purpose, Luke? Like, is that just a subtle, very subtle twist of Jesus is still different? I mean, I mean, goodness, you couldn't please don't go and preach that on Sunday morning. But, you know, but it just is really neat that you get this slightly inverted pattern of sitting and standing between Paul and Jesus. I mean, my goodness, I've, I've taken us so far off the beaten track, but I figured you would enjoy that as much as I would. Oh, no, I love that. It's, it's, it's so cool. And and of course, we, we would understand that when someone comes to eventually teach, so Paul probably sat down to teach and as Jesus sat down to teach. But of course, what's what's really lovely in the writing, the way Luke writes it. So if you know the background of how this works, that both men ultimately probably sit down to teach because that's the yeah. way it worked. But the way he writes it, there's a lovely little sym symmetrical inversion, which I'd never seen before. That's just really cool. <laughs> I really like that as a little, I, yeah, you, you, your introduction is a little playful idea. So you, yeah. again, we're, we're, we're not building, we're not building the universe on this, but it's a mm. cool little inversion, which, which from the same author suggests something yes. a little bit, a little bit of fun there, which is great. I love that. Well, well there's this play almost of the, the, that Saul goes in and submits himself to the synagogue system, mm. but the Messiah walks in, stands up and, and, and announces mm. the good news of, of the Messiah coming. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of gorgeous in that level. It's beautiful. Um, I, I want to also just mention John, because uh, I think this is important for us as listeners today is just the traditional aspect. I mean, we've mentioned already, but I'd love us to circle back really is probably more what I mean. They went to the synagogue because it was the day that you go to the synagogue. And I think we're in a sort of period within at least the circles that you and I move in that it's becoming almost trendy, can I say, to not go to church. <laughs> and, and, and be careful. I want to be careful of that kind of church to synagogue immediate contrast. Yeah, yeah. But what we see in the early Christians is they go to the synagogue on the Sabbath because that's what you do, right? Yeah. And they keep doing that 
it seems from church history, they keep doing that until they're no longer really welcome. Uh, And at which point they seem to transition that over into their own gatherings. If we get together on the Lord's day and, and, and there's this sort of, and I hear myself as I say this, it would be very easy to hear what I'm saying as, oh, this is just an, an old guy campaigning for people to go to church. But I kind of, if that's what people hear, I'm okay with that, with everything, maybe apart from the old guy bit. But the, <laughs> yeah, that, you know. that I actually think it's becoming a little trendy to say, well, maybe we don't need to go to church all the time. And I, I think it's worth observing that for the early Christians, I don't know that they would have sat comfortably with that conversation. Mm. I think, mm. I think we see them even in Hebrews, like don't give up meeting together. And it sounds very uncool to say, but I think one of the beauties of being in a two text context is we're not in pastoral leadership over our two text community. So I think it's helpful to just observe that when your church community say to you, we like to see you here regularly. They're actually really deeply in the way of the early Jesus followers in asking mm. that of us. It's not, mm. it's actually not the imposition that it's beginning to sound like for mm. a pastor to say to the congregation, you, you should come every week. Like gathering mm. together every week is functionally what mm. it was to be an early Christian. I mean, Talk me back off the ledge if you think I'm I'm being too too strong there. No, no, I I don't think you're being too strong at all. I I, I think if you look at a Judeo Christian worldview, that's a well worn, well established uh, thought process and practice that Jesus, Paul, Barnabas would have been schooled in rhythmic behaviour that was mm. that was weekly, that was to do with the great feasts. That, that they would celebrate the great feast throughout the year. I, I mean, at this point of recording uh, these podcasts, the Jewish world has just celebrated Yom Kippur, an mm-hmm. annual event, and they're about to celebrate Sukkot at the end of this, this coming week. So these are rhythmic ideas that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, the, in theory, you're supposed to readjust your world into that rhythm so that you are reminded of the ideas at the center of your faith and also so that within a community context you can encourage one another uplift one another and and establish one another to go back out into the world whatever your world looks like and carry your faith in that context it's interesting you allude to the hebrews the, the writer to the hebrews says don't don't forsake the coming together and alludes to this idea that it's within that coming together that we encourage one another and spur each other on to good works. Mm. So, so you get this lovely idea. And, and of course, what, what you see in the book of Acts on a number of dynamic occasions is that Paul works very, very hard to do this, both within a Jewish worldview, where he can, where it's appropriate to do that, mm. and where he's accepted. But then when what we might call Christian gatherings start emerging, he really works hard at sticking with. I mean, there's an amazing example of this later on in the book of Acts, David, mm-hmm. where Paul and Silas are beaten up, thrown in prison in a place called Philippi. They are then released. And there's a funny little sort of end of that story where, where they get released. And they try to release them quietly. And Paul says, no, 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 get, get, <laughs> get the magistrates the to come. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going out the front door, not the back door sort of thing. It's really quite funny. But then it says this, David, right at the end of chapter 16, it's almost, it's almost hidden in plain sight. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house. Now, at the beginning of that passage, we know that Lydia has become a follower of Jesus. She's opened up her home. And it's clear that the ecclesia is meeting in her home, right? So it says they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. And then it says this, Dr. Luke adds, then they left. (laughs) So the magistrates say, right, get out of Philippi. And Paul goes, yeah, fair enough. We're going out the front door of the jail. That's the first thing we're doing. And secondly, before we leave, we're going to go to the gathering where the Christian community is. We're going to make sure they are encouraged before we leave. Now, I so so what you're seeing in Paul and Barnabas 
in Acts 13, verse 14, is not just, oh, this is a cool missional idea. Why don't we go to the synagogue where we can preach Jesus? Now, does that happen? Yes, it does. Does that become a missional pattern? Yes, it does. But I think it's even deeper than that. I think even if they weren't preaching Jesus, they would still go to that synagogue because there's an affinity and a and a connectedness in that world which will feed their faith in in mm. what in how, in how they read Tanakh and how they read the Old Testament scriptures, mm. and here's Paul doing exactly the same in a Christian community later on. He's he's not running off with Silas. Let's get out of here. He says, "Hey, before we go, let's get with the ecclesia. Let's encourage them because that's what the ecclesia does when it gathers. It encourages one another, and then mm. then when we've done that, then we'll leave." Mm. So, so this is, I, I don't think this is just a missional strategy. I think this is a worldview pattern. I think mm. these are men practicing what they did every single week. They mm. went to Shabbat. And I think that weekly rhythm, if we can, of gathering together as Christian communities to encourage one another, to bless one another, to serve one another, uh, to inspire one another to follow Jesus. Mm. I think it is if possible, I, I would put it as strongly as this. I, I for me, it's a non-negotiable. So it, it, it's 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 only off the table if it's impossible. Where it's mm. possible, we should seek to do everything in our power to do it. Mm-hmm. That would be my personal, uh, not not just my personal opinion, David. That that's my practice. So I, I I've been I've been trained and schooled in that, and I have seen the value of gathered. Christian community for the value of my faith, not just for something I can give, but for something I can receive, not just for an expression of my ministry, but as an expression of my faith in Jesus. And and I think it's a, I think it's a really important idea for us in a 21st century world that, that wants to perhaps say we don't need this gathering as much. And I Mm. would push back on that really. And I, I mean, we've, I'm cutting loose a little bit from Acts here. Although maybe maybe not entirely. There's two things. I, 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 I imagine that there's a couple of pastors here or there listen to our podcast as well. And I, I would say that it then falls upon us as pastors to, to ensure that what we offer to people in the gathering I think also aligns with what we see in the early church. Like it's, it's, mm. I, I was thinking about Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. And like legitimately, you wouldn't do badly if that was your format for a church service. Absolutely. And, and I do think there's a slight, I, I, again, I'm speaking from within the challenge, there's a slight tendency to to be reductionist with a church service and a church service is just songs and a sermon. And, Mm. and I think we would do well to see a service as does it have teaching? Does it have fellowship? Does it have the breaking of bread? And does it have the prayers? Mm. And too easy it is to get in and out of church without being prayed for (laughs) these days. Mm. And, and I, and I think there's a bit of a revival going on around the world around in evangelical and Pentecostal circles around actually coming back to the table regularly as well. Mm. The Pentecostal church I grew up in, that was that was why we got together on the Sunday morning. And I think we've sort of kind of phased that sort of thing out. So I would I would want to encourage pastors of encourage people to come to church weekly and then have a weekly gathering that reflects what we see the early church gathering for. Mm, for sure. And for sure. And I don't think it needs to be more impressive than that. John, I was in a teaching session recently where a friend of mine was was teaching and, and he said this and I absolutely loved it. The question was posed, but why should we go to church? And mm. and, and, and and my friend is very, very scholarly and brilliant theologian. And he answered because God said so. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, he said, I could give you multiple other reasons for it, but I think the best reason is because we're told to. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? And I, I sat back and thought, I love the bravery of just, of just saying that of yeah, actually. Yeah. But then the other thing that I, I, I would want to just throw out there that I have found def- deeply life giving as a pastor recently. And I would say this to anybody listening to either if you are a pastor or, or if you're the person that can support your pastor, your pastor in this, one of the challenges of pastor is you never go to church. Right? Yeah, you're invariably you are 
you know, running church, which is a terrible, horrible term, but you know, you're often, so, so I have found one of a, a practice I started just this year, which started for multiple reasons, but I found that there's a church local to me do a very small midweek breaking of bread service. Mm -hmm. And I sneak along to that. And I mean, I would say sneak along. I don't mean like there's anything untoward in that. But I go and I meet with with a, a group of people that are that are in much different stages of life than I am. And and we have a half hour service that I attend. Mm -hmm. And I John I couldn't, I realize we've, we're now just into just biographical stuff in our <laughs> podcast here, but John, I couldn't tell you how much I love it to, yeah. to turn up at a service and just be somebody who is mm. at a service. And, and I, and I've realized, my goodness, I haven't done this for long enough in my life mm. as a pastor. I'm always at a service with one eye on, is everything going okay here? And I'm, I'm hoping that what happens is it becomes deeply good for me and the people that I serve, that I too know what it's like to just turn up and go, I wonder what the sermon will be <laughs> and where, who's going to be there? Who am I going to see? And I don't know, I would just encourage anybody listening, if you're in a position of leadership in a church where you are always leading a service, mm. you know, try and find a space like Paul and Barnabas, where you can go to the synagogue and just sit, sit down. Back. I mean, is, is that okay to say, John? Oh, David, that's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And I think, I, I think there's something beautiful, even for those in leadership who are often given the responsibility to lead services that... When you can simply go and be part of community as a member of community without mm. the pressure of running that community expression, mm. I think you will also experience things differently. You'll see things mm. differently. You'll realize even sitting there on the third row as part of that community, <laughs> breaking bread together, there's a whole bunch of stuff you worry about as a leader of a mm. community, as a leader of a service, you think nobody's really worried about that. Like, why am <laughs> I worried about that? Why, why has that become... And and actually, I, I, I love the correlation of what Paul tries to say to a gathering of New Testament believers who follow Jesus and the correlation to, to synagogue in the sense that, that, that the synagogue service had very simple elements, maybe six elements to it, mm -hmm. which had progressional dynamic, which ranged from prayers to confessions to the to the reading of the scriptures to the preaching of the scriptures, and then of course you would have you would have community gathering outside and around all of that mm -hmm. within a Jewish worldview. And I think Paul tries to pick up on that when he says, "Look, when we come together, let there be psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Come ready yeah. to contribute. Come ready to give to one another." and and certainly, if I've experienced anything in modern church, the pressure on leaders today to have this nine out of ten seamless, brilliant mm. perfection, no mistakes, no wrong notes, no glitches yeah. in the media presentation. And do you know what? I don't actually think that's primarily important. I think yeah. I, I think when the when the hearts are people put up with the odd duff note, they put up they understand things go wrong. Yeah. And and we've got to try and help even congregations move away from a consumerist understanding of the service they're attending. And recognize you're not here just to say get a great presentation, a great preach, but you're here actually to contribute something as well. Mm. Whether that's formally in the service, which isn't always possible, or just contribute as a follower of Jesus to conversations and community all around mm -hmm. you. And and I think thinking about the elements of devotion to the apostles' teaching, devotion to prayer, devotion to breaking bread, devotion to fellowship. If we if we put a wee bit of energy into some of those elements in our gatherings, I, I think I think maybe people would come more and sit and be with us. So so for me, the, the, this this beautiful, almost hidden in plain sight statement in Acts 13, 14, they, they turn up to the synagogue, implication as was their custom, and they sat down. And you just the normality of that. And Paul is sitting there waiting for the scriptures to be read, waiting for the litany to be led, wait, waiting for the, the, the prayers of confession, waiting for Shema, waiting, waiting for all the stuff that he would have rehearsed over and over again as a boy. And now there he is as a follower of Jesus, sitting in a synagogue, participating in the beautiful rhythmic idea of gathering together with the believers and encouraging our faith as we go. 
I mean, there's, <laughs> look at this. There's, brothers, if you have any word of exhortation with the people, give it, right? And Paul stands up and apparently off the cuff rolls out, like, I'm just looking at this. For 40 years, God put up with us in the wilderness. He destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan for 450 years. He, he then brought them to their inheritance. After this, he gave them judges to Samuel. And then they got a king, and it was Saul, son of Kish, who was from the tribe of Benjamin. He reigned for 40 years. And then they removed him, made David their king. And he was the son of Jesse. I mean, this is all in Paul. <laughs> it's all that. And yet, he's willing to turn up at the service and just sit down and listen to the law and the prophets being read. Okay. It's gorgeous, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. And, and it shows again the humility and the deep conviction to the idea of gathering. He's not just gathering because he's a great teacher. He's gathering because gathering is good. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think that's the gorgeous, unmissable idea Whatever else is going on there, I think it's a it's a gorgeous, unmissable idea that that, that is communicated that they sat down because yeah. they're committed to a worldview of sitting down with believers in the context of worshiping the one true and living God. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with either of us about something we said, you can reach out to us on podcast at twotext.com or by liking and following the Two Text Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you really did enjoy the episode, then we'd love it if you left a review or a comment where you're listening from. And if you really enjoyed this episode, why not share it with a friend? Don't forget that you can listen to all of our podcasts from this season and others at www.2text.com. But that is it for now. So until next time, goodbye.